the institutional quality of reporting, underwriting, communication that we need to do for the institutional capital, we take that exact approach and apply it to all of our investors, big and small. Welcome to Multifamily Insights, the show to help you succeed as an apartment investor. Listen in as John Kasman interviews experts to help you find the best places to invest, attract investors, and scale your portfolio. This is Multifamily Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. If you're enjoying the show, do me a favor and leave us that rating and review. And if this is your first time listening, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Now, today we've got a good one. We're going to be talking to Rob Beardsley. Now, if you're interested in multifamily and you want to review a sample deal, you are in luck. We have a special download on our website of a sample deal package. Just go to kasmancapital.com slash sample deal, and you'll also join our mailing list to get tips and exclusive investment opportunities. Again, that's kasmancapital.com slash sample deal. All right, Rob Beardsley oversees acquisitions and capital markets for Lone Star Capital, and he's acquired over $300 million of multifamily real estate. Now, he's evaluated thousands of opportunities using proprietary underwriting models and published the number one book on multifamily underwriting, The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. Let's welcome to the show, Rob Beardsley. Thanks a lot for having me. Absolutely. Hey, Rob, I went over your bio at a very, very high level. Take two minutes and fill in some of those gaps. Sure. So my business partner and I, we started Lone Star Capital, which is our multifamily investment company a little over four years ago. Prior to forming Lone Star, I had a little bit of experience in real estate through my family's uh, residential real estate businesses as far as brokerage and construction back in California, but I really wasn't too involved. What happened was while in school, I was studying computer science, but I found real estate, fell in love with kind of the long-term passive cash flow business model and kind of the team aspect of it. And because of growing up, I looked at my parents' business and it wasn't really attracted to it. I thought it was a lot of work and they weren't building assets. They were just churning deals and that didn't excite me. So I didn't like that part of real estate. But then when I discovered multifamily and saw that I could kind of, like I said, build that patient long-term outlook, that really attracted me to the business. And I was really fortunate to meet my business partner who I was able to start Lone Star with and actually start building that out and putting those types of deals together. So like you said in my bio, since we formed Lone Star, we've acquired over 300 million in assets and we've launched our own property management company. That's been great to scale our portfolio. And right now we're actually in the process of hiring and bringing construction in-house as well. I love it. And you mentioned that you kind of grew up around the industry with your parents' business, but that wasn't really attractive to you the way they were running it with single family properties. But multifamily, the passive income, the scale, that was attractive. And that's ultimately what led you down to partnering with your partner to grow up at scale. How did you meet that partner? What was it that you guys went through? And how did you find out that you two could work together and build this business together? Yeah. So, first off, we were insanely lucky because we met through a mentorship program that all three of us are in the Joe Fairless Mentorship Program. And so we met at one of the earlier on uh, best ever conferences. And it was fairly early in both of our journeys. I had been working in multifamily for about a year or so. And he was working for about a couple of years. So he had a little more experience, but we were pretty new. And we were both looking for that edge, that partner that could push us and take us to the next level, really accelerate our growth. But we weren't necessarily in a rush to make a partnership happen. But through our first meeting and just starting to collaborate, it just went from kind of talking shop and talking deals here and there to then underwriting deals together and talking about deals every day and then starting to actually put offers and try to make something happen. And even when we put our first deal under contract together, it wasn't necessarily this idea that, all right, we're building a company together and this is our forever business. It was still, hey, let's put this deal under contract and let's put it together and let's see where this goes. And I think that's one of the amazing benefits of real estate is it's very acceptable to date and to do one-off deals. You could do a deal together and if it doesn't work out amazingly, no hard feelings, you don't have to do a deal ever again together. So I think that collaboration and dating aspect is really helpful in trying to find the right partners. But the reason why I said we were so lucky is because we kind of just, everything fell into place so naturally and it was 
just such an easy transition to say, okay, this is working. Let's just go all in. And I think <laughs> looking back on it, it's kind of almost irresponsible. Like you, we probably should have taken a little more time and done a little more due diligence. But like I said, we're just really lucky. Well, I think too, it goes to show that if you understand fundamentally what you're looking for, you get to know each other kind of slowly, right? You talked about talking on the phone, underwriting deals together. Let's maybe do a deal together and let's see how it goes. Well, you're getting feedback at each one of those steps, right? So if there's some red flags, at some point they're going to start to show and you're going to start to say, okay, wait a minute, I got to watch out for this. I don't know about that guy or I don't know about this, but it sounds like that really didn't happen. You were able to figure out how to work together and ultimately start working together to grow and build this business. You've been able to grow to $300 million in acquisitions and properties. Congratulations to you for that. Walk me through kind of where you focus, because I know underwriting is a skill that you've kind of mastered, but was that always your skill or what exactly made you kind of focus in on that? Yeah, when getting started in the business, my analytical mind naturally gravitated towards underwriting. And on a fundamental level, I wanted to understand how the business works. And I feel like you can't really understand this business or investing if you don't understand the numbers that really support everything and make everything work. So that desire to really understand, okay, how does this business work? How do you actually make returns? How do you create value? That also pushed me towards mastering the underwriting piece. And then of course, aside from just understanding the fundamentals, how do you actually find a good deal, right? And there's a lot more than just numbers to finding a good deal. And that's something that I've matured and learned over time as well, right? You can't be too zeroed in on numbers because you can kind of zoom too far in and then miss out the big picture. But uh, underwriting is a really good way to actually find deals that stand out from the crowd and really identify good opportunities. No, great stuff there. And you wrote the definitive guide to underwriting multifamily acquisitions, right? So walk me through that process. Why did you write the book and what sparked you to say, I need to put this out in the marketplace? Yeah. So one of the funny things was when getting started, I, of course, wanted to underwrite and needed an underwriting model. And I thought, well, that's great. I'll just go online and download a model. And my dad actually was the one that gave me the advice and said, no, you shouldn't download and use some model. You should build your own. And I thought that was crazy because why would I recreate the wheel, right? There's already perfectly good models out there. Let me just download them and get to work. But I don't even know if he really fully understood how good of advice that was. But through the process of saying, okay, fine, I'm going to build my own model it caused me to do so much more research and learn so much more and gain so much understanding about underwriting and the business itself because I'm actually going a level deeper and figuring out how to put the numbers together and the formulas, calculations, and then thinking about it kind of from a logic standpoint of, okay, well, what outputs do I want to see? What returns do I want to look at? And what numbers, how you organize everything together? So that process was hugely beneficial to just gaining experience. And through that process and learning to underwrite, there was no real guide. There was no book out there. Things were a bit murky, right? You could maybe sign up for a weekend course and pay thousands of dollars. You could maybe watch some YouTube videos or read books that were just way too academic and institutional and weren't really applicable. So going through that process, I told myself, okay, well, once I master this, I'm going to turn around and write that book that'll fit this exact niche. And that's exactly what I did with my book because. My book is so straightforward, so to the point. I see all these books and they're great. I mean, I read all the books. I love learning, but it's always like, let me tell you my background and the story. And then mine is so cut and dried. And I think that's why a lot of people love it. And then maybe a lot of people probably don't love it for that. But that was really the inspiration. No, I appreciate it. And uh, we'll make sure we link to that book in the show notes there if anybody wants to check out that book. Rob, recently I had a chance to catch you speaking. We both spoke at a conference and I was in the audience when you were presenting and I loved what you were talking about. And you kind of have this beautiful mix of working with retail everyday investors, but you also work with institutional investors. Talk to me a little about that process because uh, you know we often talk about working with re retail investors and raising capital with retail investors, but it's not very often that we talk about what it's like to work with institutional investors. How did you get introduced to institutional capital for your deals? It was something that we were desirous of doing very early on, really before we had enough experience, track record, and infrastructure to really support being invested in by institutional capital. But nevertheless, we were pushing on it very early on and starting to build those relationships 
before we were really ready for them. And I think that was really beneficial in speeding up the timeline, just getting our name out there, going to conferences and trying to meet family offices, funds, and larger equity groups like that. And I think it fits our personalities well. We like the sophisticated, kind of more rigorous type of partner. And that has benefited us a lot because when you work with institutional capital, you actually learn so much because they're the ones with the experience actually, right? So they don't have to be super hands-on. They're not necessarily looking to be another cook in the kitchen, but they are great advisors, right? You can come to them and say, okay, here's our fork in the road right now. COVID just happened. What do we do? And they can give you amazing advice and keep you calm. And they've been there before. So there's an advisor component, which is really good for growth. There's also, they can be more flexible. For example, retail investors, it's hard to convince them to accept no cash flow. But an institutional investor or a family office that is more long-term thinking or just more comfortable with risk, you could say, hey, we're going to take this deal over. It's half vacant. There's going to be no cash flow in the first year. But when we turn this thing around, the returns are going to be huge. And so they can buy into business plans like that. Now, the downside is a lot more rigorous. You're going to hear a lot more no's. They are going to pay you way less in fees and promote, and they're going to have control of the deal. So those are the give and takes. But we jumped into that space feet first and are really excited about kind of everything that it has to offer while still continuing to grow and work with our retail investor base. It's something that we want to do in parallel. It's not like I see a lot of firms, they go from the retail and then they graduate to the institutional. And that's not what we're looking to do. We want to serve both markets. And I'll end this on this note as well. The institutional quality of reporting, underwriting, communication that we need to do for the institutional capital, we take that exact approach and apply it to all of our investors, big and small. And I think that's one of our differentiating factors. That was a great point there because there is a professionalism that's necessary when you're working with institutional capital. So it makes sense that you would apply that across the portfolio moving forward. So you talked about really the mix of both institutional and retail capital. Let's talk about that a little bit. So in a given deal, do you have different tier structures? Do you have the institutional capital as kind of its own tier and then your LPs as a separate tier? But give me a little bit of context of what that actually looks like on a deal. Yeah, no, this is a great topic and there's so many ways to slice up the deal. So here's kind of a cool structure where you have a true joint venture where you have us, the sponsor, and then an institutional capital partner as the limited partner or the joint venture equity partner. So typically you'll see those set up in a 90-10 structure is what they're called, where they're bringing in 90% of the equity. And then we as a sponsor are responsible for 10% of the equity. Now, the structure between the two parties there will be outlined in the operating agreement of the deal itself. So that is very straightforward. But then that 10% sponsor equity, we can go out, not all the time, because sometimes the capital partner wants that 10% equity to come just from you. So they know that, that your skin is in the game and But a lot of times they know that 10% slice might still be a million dollars, $2 million. And that's a lot of money for somebody to put up all themselves. So they're okay with you going to your investors. And that's where the retail comes in. And that's why having both is so valuable. You don't want to be stuck having some 90-10 partnership where you have a family office bringing you $20 million, but you can't bring the two and you're stuck. So the retail is really valuable in that sense. And The way that that would be structured is the main operating agreement would outline the terms between sponsor and institutional capital, but the sponsor vehicle here for the 10% would actually be its separate LLC. And then inside of that LLC would be another operating agreement that would allow retail investors to come in, invest on their terms that they're used to, and it's normal. So they're completely separate in the way that they're investing and the institutional capital is investing. And I think a really important point that some people don't understand is that when you have different groups like this, it doesn't necessarily mean that one group has priority over the other. So some people might assume, well, the institutional capital partner probably wants to get their return first and then the retail investor second. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be what is called pari passu, which means that the investors are treated equally. So as distributions are flowing out, they go to each party on an equal basis. Yeah. And in that case, it kind of to your point, if it's parapasu, then you know a lot of times we do a pref return, right? A preferred return where the first whatever percentage of profit goes to those LP investors. But in that case, you would really remove that. Is that fair to say? 
Well, it's not necessarily that you would remove it. The pref might be different. So let's just say, for example, an institutional capital partner might have a 10% pref, which is great for them. And then retail investors typically invest at an 8% pref. So just because the prefs are different, doesn't mean the priorities are different. Again, it's still part of pursue, but what it affects is when the GEP starts getting paid. So because the institutional partner has a 10% pref, the distributions have to fill up their 10% first, and then the GP starts making money. Whereas on the retail side, it only has to fill up to eight. So the sponsor starts making money sooner, but there's again, still no priority over the other. Yeah, it can get a little complex and obviously we could keep going down this rabbit hole. But the point is, is that there are lots of ways to structure deals and they don't necessarily mean that if you bring in an institutional partner that they get first priority on return. So there are ways you can do that and you can obviously explore that more and more. I want to talk more about where this starts. So you kind of make that decision that, hey, we want to work with institutional capital. You mentioned that you kind of attended some events, but like, how did you find and start meeting some of these people? I mean, was it truly just going to networking events or was there something else where you start to put yourself in the room or build up your database of institutional investors? Yeah, I think the right events can be a great place to go. But at the end of the day, like all events, it's still a bit of a hit or miss and a lot of work. The other thing that's been great is just networking and talking to other sponsors and who they're working with, you know, because institutional capital, whether it be a, like a private equity fund or a family office, they want deals, right? That's what they're out there looking for. So they want you just as much as you want them. And so they're not necessarily these secretive groups hiding around, like they want to be found, but they're not necessarily out there marketing themselves as well as they could potentially. But I found them on LinkedIn Press releases are a great way to go. So if you're reading kind of the different multifamily news sources, there might be an announcement saying, oh, well, this sponsor or this developer just closed a deal and it'll mention who the lender was. It'll mention who the equity partner was sometimes, not always. And then that's when I start digging. I say, oh, this equity partner. Well, let me look into them. What do they invest in? Are they a fit for us? If they're a fit for us, I'll shoot a cold email and try to get in touch. And that's actually been very successful. So that has been good. And yeah, I think just being in the business, you eventually start to come across more names and you need to collect them and you need to build the relationships. You don't need a million of them. That's the benefit, right? The difference between retail and institutional is if you just get a few good ones that invest with you on a repeat basis, that's a lot of capital. That's a lot of business. So you just need to stay patient on that. Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you know, reaching out cold emails that actually does work, which is interesting to hear because you think about reaching out to these groups with millions and multi millions of dollars, sending a cold email seems like one of the worst things you could do, but you're actually getting pretty good response because that you've got what they're looking for, right? They're looking for deals. And if that's what you offer, and I'm sure you reach out and say, Hey, I saw your press release or whatever, and you can get the conversation going. But I think that's really interesting. I want to go back to the point you just made though about, you really don't need a ton of them. You really just need a handful and you want to build good relationships with them. When we say build relationships, what exactly do you mean, right? Does that mean just call them every couple of months or what exactly is that process to build a relationship with a private equity group or an institutional fund? Yeah, I think there's multiple components. I think step number one is to start, obviously get the intro, however you get the intro, but then from there, as quickly as possible, start talking deals. Because if you start getting them involved in a deal, even if they pass on it, right, they spent the time to review it, they're thinking about it, they're thinking about you, and that's a good first step. Now, they're most likely going to pass on your first deal or first five deals that you send them because they've got a lot of other deals and the other deals that they're actually doing are with people that they actually know. And if a lot of deals look the same that that are coming in, right, they're just going to pass on the ones that they don't really know you and they'll stick to doing the deals with the people that they know. So while talking deals is helpful, it still doesn't quite get you there. So kind of breaking the ice kind of level two is in-person meeting or Zoom calls and just becoming a real person and a real company to them rather than just this entity that's sending them deal flow, right? Yes, they appreciate deal flow and that's they're in the business of deals. They need the deal flow. I think that's valuable. And like you said, calling every two months, I would say that's fine. But as long as there's actually a deal, right, there needs to be a live deal. If you can say, hey, I have this deal under contract, I'm actually 
moving and shaking and deals are happening, whether you sign up for it or not, that's pretty powerful. So if you can show them a deal and then they pass on it, but then two months later you close and you can email them, Hey, ended up closing on that deal. I've got a new one coming up. Here's what it's looking like. Let's discuss further. That is big. No, I think that's a great point because if you can do deals without them, then you don't need them. You want them, but you don't need them. And if you don't need them, now that starts to create a little bit more intrigue on their side as well, particularly if you're moving forward with deals. So that's a great tip. Talk to us about the first deal you did with the institutional investor. What was that like? How long had you known them? Just walk us through kind of that experience. Yeah, I think we knew them for a little over a year. So we met one of their people at a conference and just kept the relationship going from there. We showed them a deal that they did like, but just because we were so new and it was the first deal that we really were looking at together with them, they had to pass. They basically said, hey, we really like you guys and we like this, but this is just early. Why don't you take over this deal and do well with it and call us in six months or a year and say, hey, I told you so, we're doing well. And they kind of wanted to keep tabs on us, which is frustrating at the time because at the time you're like, give me money now, I need to do this deal. But they're patient and they have a lot of deal flow. And so they have the luxury of doing that. So it's kind of like they made a paper trade on us where they're like, hey, we like this deal, we would invest in this, but instead we're just going to kind of keep tabs on it and see whether we are making the right bet. So when we were able to show them, hey, we're doing well with this deal, this is how it's happening, that built confidence. And they said, okay, well, we had the right first thought about this group. And so then when we showed them the next deal, it still wasn't easy, but we were able to get a deal done there, which was really big. And obviously getting a deal at that level done and then also building the relationship because after you get the first one done, the next ones become so much easier because now they have a confirmation bias And they want to get a lot of value out of their sponsor due diligence. They don't want to do sponsor due diligence on every single deal, right? They want to do sponsor DD, approve you as a sponsor. And then from there, they want to get their money's worth and just reinvest. So that's a big step. Now, a lot of great insights right there. One you talked about, you shared a deal with them. They passed just because, just they didn't want to do the first deal. They wanted to keep tabs on you, see how you perform. And if you did that, kind of passing that first test, then they would come back and invest in future deals, which they did there. And I think a couple of key lessons I just wrote down there is, one, going back to how do you establish these relationships? One, start with deals. Deals are what you're there to talk about. Make sure you've got deals you can put in front of people. But then two, get some real connectivity. Talk in person, get on some Zooms, whatever it is to really build a face and put a face to a name and really make that connection. That's great. But also be patient because they're probably not going to do the very first deal you put in front of them. So make sure that you are patient and make sure you can do the deals without them. Because if you can do it without them, that's going to be even more appealing when you come back around and say, hey, I did this deal without you. If you want to get in on the next deal, here's the opportunity. It's almost creating FOMO, which seems a little funny talking about creating FOMO with a large institutional capital. But it's kind of what you're doing, right? You're going out there, you're demonstrating what you can do. You're creating these great returns for your other investors, and you're seeing if they want to get on board for the next one. So really great insights on how to actually get the ball rolling if you are looking to work with them. You started to allude to some of the downsides earlier, talked about control of the deal and deal structure and things like that. What are some of the things we have to be mindful of if you are going to go down this path? Yeah, the downsides are as far as fees and all that, it's pretty obvious, right? If you're working with a large group and getting one check instead of 100, that's going to come with getting paid lower fees and they'll have a more favorable structure, potentially a higher preferred return than you're used to, and then maybe a lower promote. So that's pretty straightforward. The control side, I think, is really overrated. I think people overreact to investors' desire to have control. The, what I always say is, it doesn't matter what the documents say, whoever has the most money in the deal has the control. Because at the end of the day, as a sponsor or whoever, you're not going to want to do something that the major investor is against in a deal anyway, even if you have the power to do so. But with that being said, right, typical major decision rights in a joint venture like this is going to include to sell when they want to refi when they want to. And they also can approve major CapEx items. So if you want to go off budget and you want to spend money on a new pool, right, they want to have a right to say yes or no to that. So those are all very straightforward. And those are things that you would want to talk to your partners anyway about, right? You wouldn't want to just 
list the property for sale and say, hey guys, we're selling. Now, obviously in a retail scenario where you have a hundred investors in a deal and they're all very small percentage, you don't have to go to them and say, hey, we're thinking about selling. What do you think, right? You're the sponsor. What you're paid to do is to make those decisions. But again, when you have investors that bring so much experience to the table, you want to, it's not, you shouldn't feel like you have to, but you should want to, you get to talk to them about, hey, what do you think about selling right now? What is the math breakdown like? So that's the control thing. And then the other thing I also mentioned earlier was kind of the rigor of due diligence and reporting, right? If you're going to work with an institutional partner, your reporting has to be on point. It can't just be an email that says, hey, occupancy is here and we're doing great. See you next month, right? They need uh, budget versus actuals. And they might, they'll also ask for specific analyses just ad hoc. They might say, hey, in light of recent changes in interest rates, can you put together an analysis that shows kind of our break even and our different scenario options there? So we're always putting together kind of one off analyses as well. So just being in a position, having the tools together to be able to report adequately and be transparent and sophisticated. So I would say that is technically a downside, but it's just really great to build up those capabilities anyway. Yeah. And it sounds like it also allows you to be really in a more sophisticated position to know exactly what's happening with the deal. And it's not they're just making random requests to, to make them, right? You're talking about just understanding what's happening with the deal, being able to forecast and project what may be coming down the pipeline and identifying any potential issues before they become serious issues. So all in all, things that help the deal, not necessarily you. I mean, it might be more work for you, but they overall are, are at the intent of helping the deal and make sure they understand what the, where things are headed. Great insights right there, Rob. I know that you are looking to help other people who are looking to gain access to institutional capital. You've got an event coming up. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So last year we hosted our first event and this year we're bringing it back September 19 and 20. Uh, we're calling it the LSC NY Summit. Basically, the event is me bringing together the best from our network, and particularly when it comes to family offices, funds, crowdfunding platforms, and pref equity lenders. So bring all that together, and then with sponsors as well. And we do a lot of, obviously, networking, but we do a deal shark tank where we put sponsors on the stage to pitch deals to the panels of institutional investors, then you get to kind of get inside the minds of these institutional investors and see live how they react to deals and what type of questions they ask, and hopefully get some deals done. So the Shark Tank is probably one of my favorite things. And then just having panels talking about the state of the market and hearing it from the investors themselves is really valuable. You know, I think it's a bit unique. Obviously, you and I go to a lot of conferences and they're very valuable. But most of the time on stage, it's sponsors, which it's great to learn from your peers, but what we try to do is put most of the time on stage uh, capital so we can hear it from them. What are they looking for? And that is really beneficial aside from the networking. Obviously, networking is by far the most value you can get from something like this, but that's kind of the different spin that we try to bring as far as the content. I love it. Well, we'll definitely make sure we link to that as well. If you want to check that out, it is the LSC NY Summit. Uh, September 19th and 20th. If you want to learn more about this or anything else working with Rob and his team at Lone Star Capital, you can go to lscre.com. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Our first capital raise, it perfectly ties into the subject. We bought into the myth that if you find a good deal, the money will come. And it's just so not true. We struggled so much raising capital just because we didn't dig the well before we were thirsty. We took it for granted. Neither of us, meaning my business partner and I, were particularly passionate about raising money. We were thinking, hey, why do we want to be distracted by raising money? Let's just do deals. When in reality, you can't do deals without raising the money. So that was a major, fi we were able to get the deal done, but it was still a major failure. And it opened my eyes to the fact that this has to be a very serious thing that you devote essentially full-time effort to. So that was a paradigm shift. And I don't think that if it weren't for that experience, I don't think that we would have gone out and built uh, this thought leadership infrastructure, whether it be the monthly newsletter or podcasting or the book and conferences and just really being serious to build that ecosystem if it weren't for that failure, right? Because now we flipped the model on its head to where 
I mean, yeah, we still chase investors and we're still looking for new investors every day, but we've built a funnel to where investors come to us and that doesn't happen overnight. You need that experience to teach you, okay, I need to build this and dig the well before I'm thirsty. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. I love reading about economics and staying on top of the markets and stuff. And so I recently got turned on to the All In podcast. And that is, it's a couple guys. And I think three out of four guys are billionaires. So you have Chamath, Palihapitiya. I probably said his last name wrong, but he's a famous guy. David Sachs is a billionaire. David Friedberg, I'm not sure, but they're all really smart guys. And it's really rare that you could be listening in on a four-way conversation of billionaires talking economics, talking business. So I'm really enjoying that podcast as a new resource for me just to kind of hear their insights. More directly for multifamily, uh, justicemap.org is amazing. It's a free resource to just be able to quickly take a look at incomes for any address in the country. There you go. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. In the last year, it's probably the same as every year, but I really recommend and gift Getting More by Professor Stuart Diamond. Actually at our event last year, we had Professor Stuart Diamond come from Wharton and give us a half day negotiation workshop. And so his book Getting More is his entire negotiation methodology really packed into a super actionable book. So I really love that book. What's a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? Uh, journaling, writing down goals. If I'm doing it right, which I have been slacking off lately, what I do is I take a page in the journal and the top section, just I'll, for a couple minutes, I'll just write, I'll do gratitude journaling. And then the middle section, I'll just write down my goals. And then at the bottom, I'll write down the things I need to do that day that'll serve those goals, right? Because too many times we let the day run us and we might have all these goals, but at the end of the day, we're just answering email and not really actually taking direct steps towards our goals. Great points there. Give me your number one insight for investing. Number one insight for investing. I would say, even though I'm all about the numbers, I would say it's a lot more than the numbers. And whether you're a past investor, you know, as cliche as it is, you need to really be bought in on the sponsor or whether you're a sponsor, you need to kind of have a thesis beyond just the numbers. The numbers might look good, but how does this strategy fit in your, or how does this deal fit into your overall strategy and more long-term outlook? Because you might look at a deal and think it's an attractive buy today, but it might become the headache of your portfolio tomorrow. Love it, great tip there. And Rob, you're in New York, one of the great food meccas in the world. Give me your favorite place to grab a bite to eat. Favorite place? I wonder if this was your podcast two years ago. I think it was because then I think you asked this question two years ago and I told you Koo Ramen. It's right down the street and it's a good ramen spot, but I want to give you something else, but I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> it probably was mine. I'm pretty confident of it. I'm going to look it up real quick and see if I can find the answer to that. But that sounds like a great option and so it's still down the street from you, huh? Still down the street. Yeah. it's uh, You can't go wrong with ramen in the That's city. That's exactly you what you said. Yep. Cool yeah, yeah. Well, we know you love it because you couldn't just make that up, right? And throw it out two years later. So two years in a row. We yeah. know you actually <laughs> love it. <laughs> well, Cool Ramen, if you ever want to catch Rob, just hang out at Cool Ramen. I'm sure you'll see him there. Excellent. Listen, man, you gave us some great insights. I appreciate your time today. And one, just listening to you talk about kind of your upbringing, what got you into the space, your partnership, and how you realize that the two of you could work together. And then raising capital, particularly working with institutional investors, what that process was like, giving us tips and insights to both meet institutional investors, how to build relationships with them, and then also what we need to expect when it comes to the deal structure, as well as just getting them to say yes. They're not going to say yes to that first deal. So make sure you're patient, make sure you take the time to really get to know them and understand and what it is that they're looking for. You've got that event coming up September 19th and 20th. So we want to make sure we link to that in our show notes. And again, if you want to learn more about Rob, his company, or any of the things he's got going on, you can go to lscre.com. Rob, thanks again for coming on Multifamily Insights. We look forward to staying in touch and I hope you have a great day. Thank you for listening to this episode of Multifamily Insights, the podcast to help you become a better apartment investor. If you like this show, I need you to do three easy things. One, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. Two, leave us a rating and review so we can learn what you love about the show and how to make it better. And three, 
just chill to the next episode.